This video brought to you by Loot Crate. Go to trylootcrate.com slash halocanon and use promo code BRIDGE10 to save 10% on a new subscription. Stick around to the end for more details. Welcome back, Canonites. For the first time in a while, it seems I've caught up with the current media release schedule. Yes, today we'll be looking at Halo Fractures. The second anthology collection produced by 343 Industries, Fractures contains 11 new stories contributed by 11 authors, plus the first printings of Halo Shadow of Intent and Halo Saints Testimony, authored by Joseph Staten and Frank O'Connor, respectively. Obviously, I won't be discussing those two stories as I already covered them in individual reviews back when they released digitally. For this review, as we're talking about a series of short stories rather than a continuous novel, what we'll do is talk about each story in brief without too much detail. I'll obviously still hit the lore highlights along the way. As always, the following section will contain spoilers. If you want to go into this novel fresh, which is honestly what I recommend, you can use the annotation on the screen to skip to my spoiler-free wrap-up at the end, or check the description box below for what time to skip to. For everyone else, this is Halo Fractures. The first story is Lessons Learned by Matt Forbeck, author of Halo New Blood. The story opens later in New Blood's story, on March 29th, 2554, when Spartan 4 trainee Rudolf Skine is discovered to be an innie traitor and tries to blow up the Spartan 4 training facility with a grenade. Lessons Learned opens with Tom B-292 and Lucy B-091 attempting to rescue June after the Spartan was blown into space by Skine's grenade. The two are successful, which you'll know if you've read New Blood. After recovering from the exposure to vacuum, Tom and Lucy are transferred to Oni Research Facility Trevelyan, formerly Onyx, to help with security in what is now a Joint Species Research Facility. Yes, there are Sangheili living and working in Onyx now, which is fairly odd when you recall that just a year prior, Julian Dama was being held in Trevelyan and being experimented on. I know some people rather enjoyed this change of events, but I also saw others point out how odd it is for Oni to be willing to share this monumental discovery, given not only that the two species were warring less than two years prior, but it also had been, for a time, used for research in crippling the Sangheili. Conversely, it's entirely possible that the Arbiter's forces knew about Trevelyan's existence, or rather Onyx's, given certain events in Halo Ghosts of Onyx, thus forcing Oni's hand. Anyway, this story will be followed up on in another story called Halo Legacy of Onyx, which is currently listed for release on April 25th, 2017. This first story is a strong opener for the anthology, one I really enjoyed. Although, there's a rather hilarious error early on that refers to June as a member of Beta Company, despite the same paragraph referring to June's Spartan number, A266. Moving forward, the second story is What Remains by 343 narrative designer Morgan Lockhart. Her story follows up on Evelyn Collins, one of the survivors of the Guardian Awakening on Meridian. You may recall her audio logs and some of the Meridian intel items, or her desperate call for help towards the end of the Meridian section. Hello? Can anyone hear me? I'm at Meridian Station. Everyone's dead. Governor Sloan isn't here. I... I... Please? Is there anyone left here but me? Haunting as always. After it's clear that Evelyn is alone, she makes her way towards the medical building, where she runs into a few other survivors, including Doc Cal. Though she didn't appear in Halo 5, Cal is also mentioned in one of the Meridian recordings. I found a body in the glass today. Shook me up. <clears throat> Doc Cal said I should talk about it, so here. I'm talking about it. Think I'm done now. The survivors band together to survive on Meridian and attempt to make a call for help. When they finally succeed, they are answered by none other than Cortana. The story is a great follow-up to Halo 5's Meridian level and really fleshes out Evelyn Collins as a character. During the story, she has to make a serious effort to get other survivors to find a way to call for help, despite two of them being injured and an incoming glass storm, making note of Evelyn's experience the first time Meridian came under attack. Following that, we have Breaking Strain by Drame Swallow, a Halo newcomer. This story is set in 2553, just after the Human Covenant War ends, though our characters don't yet know that. In this story, the UNSC Dark Was the Night, a military cargo ship, crash lands on the outer colony known as Losing Hand, after suffering a Covey attack that had fatally damaged the ship's AI as she was just entering slipspace. Without the AI, the ship was forced to make emergency planetfall. Unfortunately, along with winding up on a planet that has little love for the UNSC, the crash also took out the colony's wind farm. Now, the UNSC survivors and the colonists have an uneasy, to say the least, 
relationship as the ship provides power to the town and the town provides food to the UNSC. The mistrust between the two factions is wonderfully portrayed throughout, and things only get worse when a Covenant Corvette is detected on an inbound vector. Tensions continue to rise with people on both sides ready to go to war, while others try to maintain a relative peace. Again, there are people of these types among both the UNSC and the colonists, painting the story with the beautiful shades of grey that Halo novels are often known for. War just about breaks out when the Corvette lands, revealing it to be part of a joint operations survey team. The story comes to a close as those who want to leave losing hand board the lookout, while others choose to stay. Most UNSC survivors leave along with a small number of colonists, while a few UNSC survivors remain, including Acting Captain Leon, who had a budding relationship with one of the colonists. The story is a fantastic look at the interaction between the UNSC and the colonies, and the tensions that exist even 27 years into the Covenant War. The story also features a new Spartan 3, one fitted with Mjolnir-like noble team, Kevin A282. Kevin's character arc is a very interesting one, as he goes lone wolf for most of the story. Most interestingly, however, is that he was there when Reach fell, making me wonder if he might have been part of Gauntlet, Red, or Echo teams. The next story is Promises to Keep by Christy Gold, which acts as a follow-up to the Forerunner saga, set as the survivors are reseeding the galaxy, then preparing to depart on their own great journey. I don't want to spoil too much for this one, so I'll give you the basic setup. The Isodidact, referred to mostly as Born Stellar in this tale, finally listens to the Librarian's final message, which he ignored as fake in Silentium, and discovers that he must find a way to basically reboot the Domain. So yes, this story basically explains how the Domain is around in 2558. Joined by the new Life Shaper, Chanta Green, along with former First Counselor Splendid Dust of Ancient Suns, Lifeworker Growth Through Trial of Change, Warrior Servants Glory of a Far Dawn and Sorrow for Lost Voices, Engineer Walking in Light of Falling Stars, Builder, Keeper of Stone Songs, and two other Forerunners, and Finder of Things Hidden and Thread with Care, Born Stellar returns to the Forerunner capital of Maithrillion. Once there, to avoid spoiling anything, shit goes down. This story, above all else, is one that warrants going into without any knowledge. The revelations about the Domain are astounding, to say the least. It also reveals the origins of a particular Ancilla, 000 Tragic Solitude, and why he picked that designation. This story was easily the highlight of the book for me, in many ways, and author Christy Gold does a fantastic job of following in the footsteps of Greg Bear. Next up is The Ballad of Hamish Beamish, a poem by Frank O'Connor. Hamish Beamish was a janitor at the Corbulo Academy of Military Science, and was played by Mr. O'Connor himself. When asked about Beamish online, O'Connor sort of joked about Beamish having found himself on a transport to Corbulo without a cryopod, having instead to survive on no legal food and keeping warm by shaving Colin's hair and burning it. This story more or less canonizes that tale in a manner both hilarious and tragic. After that, we have Defender of the Storm by John Jackson Miller, who will also have a story in Halo Tales from Slipspace. This tale is set towards the end of the Forerunner Flood War and follows a warrior servant manipular known as Adequate Observer. Adequate has been stationed on a gas mine known as Seclusion Spiral for the past 15 years, watching others rotate out while he seemingly remains forgotten. After another crew rotation where Adequate remained, a flood outbreak suddenly appears in the station's harvesters. During the outbreak, the entire crew short of Adequate is infected, forcing Adequate to destroy the station by sending it into a massive storm on the gas giant below. While the Harvesters are destroyed, the station's hub survives, Adequate and his Ancilla with it. We learn that the station hadn't been harvesting for the past 10 years, and this was because of a unique life form that had been discovered that could survive and thrive in the Gas Giant's atmosphere. As they couldn't be safely indexed, the Forerunners quietly turned off the Harvester but kept up the appearance of harvesting in order to keep the Flood from finding out about these unique life forms. Adequate, now trapped in the storm, decides to spend the remainder of his life finding out all he can about these life forms. To honor his actions during the Flood outbreak, his Ancilla suggests changing his name. Adequate would now be known as Defender of the Storm. This story was another fantastic read that did a great job of capturing the fear the Flood induce and necessary for any Flood-related story in my opinion. Though we don't spend much time with Adequate's crewmates, seeing them succumb to Flood infection, their bodies mutated, still draws on our emotional strings. John Jackson Miller did a fantastic job with such a short story. After that, we have Troy Denning's story, A Necessary Truth. This acts as a follow-up to Halo Last Light. A year after the events of that book, Veta Lopez and her ferrets are training to become Oni operatives. While the game is no combat, espionage is a completely different game, one Spartans in general are not familiar with. 
What starts as a training exercise quickly escalates when a reporter and an ex-ONI operative are found trying to expose the Spartan 3 program, Gamma Company in specific. The two are initially thought to be part of the training exercise, but when it becomes clear that they aren't, Veta and her team go to work to ensure the secrets of Gamma Company stay that way, all while making sure ONI doesn't shut them down. Remember, while Osman put the team together, she isn't head of ONI at this time, and still has a ton of enemies that want to bring her down. The story is a very welcome follow-up to Last Light, showing the Gammas evolving as people and characters, and showing Veta adjusting to her new life. I'd personally love to see Denning get the chance to do more with the Ferret Squad going forward. Next up is Into the Fire by Kelly Gay. Set in January of 2557 on Venezia, we follow a young woman named Ryan, leader of a salvage crew. After hearing about an opportunity from the KGR skirmisher Norfell, mate of Sobfell from Halo Mortal Dictata, Ryan and her crew set out for what should be a huge payday. After arriving on the colony moon of Eero, the crew discovers their target is a Halcyon-class cruiser, the Roman Blue, which had nearly been sliced in half by Covenant plasma fire during the war. If that ship sounds familiar, the Roman Blue was the first ship Terence Hood captained after his service as first mate of Spirit of Fire. During the battle for Arcadia, Hood was ordered to hold back and recover the Spirit's log buoy when she went after the Arbiter and Ellen Anders. Instead, however, Hood engaged the Covenant wanting revenge for what the Covenant had already done to humanity at that point. Because of his actions, the log buoy and the Spirit were lost. While rummaging around the ship, Ryan finds the logs of Captain William S. Webb, the man who took command of Roman Blue after Hood was reassigned, and here's the tale that I just related. Suddenly, the ship comes under fire from an unknown source. Ryan orders her crew to evacuate and, since she's the furthest from their salvage ship, to leave if she doesn't make it in time. Despite being under fire, Ryan smiles as she finally has a lead on her father. Into Fire is a fantastic, almost Firefly-like story with a heart-wrenching tie-in to Halo Wars. What the tie-in is, I won't say, but let's just say that Ryan's salvage ship, the Ace of Spades, along with some other clues in this summary, should give you a pretty good idea of whose daughter Ryan is. But even more exciting is that this story will get a follow-up next year. In the most recent canon fodder, Grimm revealed the names of two new stories, not necessarily books, coming out next year. The follow-up to Into Fire, also written by Kelly Gay, will be titled Halo Smoke and Shadow. The next story is Rossback's World by Brian Reed. While I think this was my least favorite story, it's by no means bad by any stretch of the imagination. The story is set at the end of Halo 5 Guardians as the created are taking control and Guardians are appearing over worlds across the galaxy. In her office at Oni HQ in Sydney, Australia, Saren Osman receives a pre-recorded message from Bibi, who notes that he has secured himself and all other AI operating at Highcom for final dispensation, and that Spartan Orzel would escort her and Admiral Hood to safety. Osman and Hood meet up in the halls of Oni HQ as Cortana's message to the galaxy comes through. Once outside, they find Spartan Orzel, a Prowler, and a Guardian in the sky. As the Prowler prepares to depart, broadswords in the UNSC Plateau engage the Guardian. The broadswords shoot missiles at the Guardian, which are eliminated by energy projectiles from the Guardian's wingtips, confirming that the Guardian has more defenses than just the EMP weapon. Just as the Prowler escapes, the Guardian unleashes its EMP, and we all know what happens next. This scene is rather interesting as, in some ways, it's reminiscent of the Guardian attack in Halo 5, but also different in a number of aspects, calling into question what planet we saw at the end of Halo 5. In Halo 5, we have a frigate approaching the Guardian, much as the UNSC Plateau does in the story. Conversely, we don't see the Guardian in Halo 5 take out any missiles, and in the story, the Guardian shows up just as Cortana is finishing her galaxy-wide broadcast. Cortana confronting Infinity at the end of Halo 5 seems to take place a good amount of time after her speech, though one could argue that the events could take place concurrently, despite Halo 5's depiction. The short story also seems to imply that the Guardian was directly over Sydney, whereas it's high above the planet in Halo 5. So, whether the planet the Guardian emps in Halo 5 is Earth is still up for debate. One could argue that the version in Rossback's world is a sort of reinterpretation, but while the presence of Infinity and Orbital Max in Halo 5 would seem to strongly suggest that the planet is Earth, the events shown play out very differently. Anyway, Hood, Osman, and Orzel are taken to a secret world by the Prowler's autopilot, a world with only a solar-powered cabin and no connections to outside communication networks. However, the Prowler has six dozen slipspace recon probes, with which the group is able to monitor the galaxy. They pick up messages of peace from the created, and a distress call from the UNSC, Sentry of El Moro, concerning an attack from the Warden Eternal. The distress call is answered by Infinity. So, in case anyone was wondering if the Warden is still active, there you go. We can see that Infinity is trying to fight back where possible, too. 
Anyway, on this world, which BB calls Rossback's world, named after a fake Spartan commander BB created, the fake identity BB used to get Saren and Hood off Earth and secure the Highcom AIs, Saren reactivates BB on her personal data pad. BB explains his actions and notes that the case that him and the other Highcom AIs are stored in, which was given to Saren before she left Earth, is rigged with explosives. If Saren chooses, she can destroy all the AIs. The story ends on a cliffhanger of sorts, with Saren debating whether to destroy the AIs wholesale or, perhaps, give them a chance to choose. A pretty good story, and certainly one of Reed's best. While the cliffhanger can be a bit upsetting, I can see why Reed wouldn't want to give a definitive answer, at least not yet. While I noted earlier that this was probably my least favorite story, one reason for that is the third-person present perspective used. For reasons I can't really explain, it's just a perspective type that has always turned me off. At the end of the day, though, the story is good. After that, we have Oasis by Halo alumni Tobias Buckle. Set in July 2558, on the colony of Cairo, a terrible sickness has broken out in a small village called Sandholm. The main character, Dahlia, and her parents were survivors of the glassing of Arcadia in 2549. They and other survivors of the war had hoped to settle on Cairo, an outer colony desert world. The area they'd surveyed, an oasis near a river, had been instead settled by Sangheili when they arrived, the settlement known as Rock. The human colonists were forced to settle elsewhere. With the sickness about to take her parents, Dahlia decides to make from Massov Oasis a Sangheili settlement that is frequented by human traders. There, she hopes she can get passage to Soraka, a large human settlement across the desert. Along the way, she encounters the Sangheili attacking another person. She decides to try and save the stranger, and though she isn't able to shoot the Sanghili with her gun, her shot provides enough of a distraction for the fallen being to light up his energy sword, killing the enemy Sanghili and revealing himself to be a Sanghili too. The Sanghili, Jot, declares that he owes Dahlia a life debt and takes her to Masov, despite his insistence that she shouldn't go there. In Masov, she is immediately taken prisoner, but soon rescued by Jot. As it turns out, Sanghili loyal to a Sanghili named Thars, who hates humans, are killing Sanghili and Masov with human weapons to frame the species. Jot was hoping to reveal this to the leader of Rock, Rajka Kassan, in order to preserve peace between humans and Sanghili on Cairo. Dahlia is freed along with other humans, the traders she had hoped to meet with. The traders go off and try and secure their own transport while Dahlia stays with Jot. They run from the Sanghili death squads, eventually facing them down in the desert. Jot manages to kill several of their pursuers, but the two are outnumbered. Surrounded and about to die, Jot and Dahlia are saved by colonial militia sent by the traitors. Jot, sadly, is killed by a militiaman, despite Dahlia's protests. The story ends with Dahlia saving her parents and no longer afraid of her enemies, despite the rising tension on Cairo. If you liked any of Buckle's previous works, you'll absolutely love this one too. A great story with great characters and an ending that is both sobering and a little bit happy. Oasis, like Into the Fire, will also have a follow-up story in 2017 titled Halo Envoy. Dahlia was an exciting character, and I hope we get to see more of her in Envoy. Whatever the story is about, though, I'll always be excited to see Buckle's name on a Halo project. The penultimate story for Fractures is a story called Anna Rosa by 343 franchise manager Kevin Grace. Grace is known best for his Halo Evolution story The Return and the CEA Terminals. Grace has a very good track record when it comes to his personal contributions to Halo, and Anna Rose is no exception. Set in March 2556, the story follows Oni Agent Pross and the AI Leo as they attempt to convince the brother of the recently deceased Anna Rose Carmelo, Michael, to donate his sister's brain for use in creating a smart AI. When they reach Michael's house, Pross gives his practice speech, to which Michael says, Go to hell. After what seems like a failure to get a particularly promising brain, Michael approaches Prowse's car and says he wants to talk to Leo instead. During their conversation, Leo reveals what it means to be an AI, as best as an AI can explain such a thing to a human anyway. He talks about how much he's able to do, but also how heavily he's monitored. The conversation is very revealing both for Leo as a character and for AI in general. For example, AI are not allowed to know who their donors are, as it can lead to trouble. We also learn that not all human brains are suited for the AI creation process, and some can create flawed AI, and those flaws can take years to discover. Ultimately though, Leo is able to convince Michael to donate Anna Rose's brain. The story is definitely one of the best ones in the book, and does a great job of exploring what it means to be an AI. What I found most interesting, however, was the potential connection to Halo Wars 2. The story is, again, set in March of 2556. Halo Wars 2 is set sometime in 2559, and the AI Isabel is said to be three years old at that point. 
During the talk between Leo and Michael, Leo reveals that the AI created from Anna Rose's brain won't be put in active combat, but on a mission of exploration to a place further than humanity has traveled before. These are only passing similarities to some aspects of Isabel's situation by the time of Halo Wars 2, but it seems likely enough, to me at least, that Isabel could have been the AI created from Anna Rose's brain. Regardless, this was another exciting story from Kevin Grace. The final story for Fractures is an uncredited, untitled piece set after the reseeding of the galaxy when the Forerunners have left. On an unknown world, orbiting an alien star in an unknown galaxy, Born Stellar makes Eternal Lasting and Chanta Green have established a new life for themselves. They have abandoned their armor, their advanced technology, for a simple life. Their great journey has come to an end. Though brief, it's a beautiful, if not expected, way to bring Born Stellar's story to an end. Moreover, it confirms that Born Stellar will not have survived into the modern day, even implying that indeed, the Ordidact may have been the last living forerunner. And that concludes Halo Fractures. Halo Evolutions was one of 343's first published Halo works, and it set a precedent for future Halo fiction that has, at times, been hard to live up to. When a new anthology was announced, one so much smaller in perceived scale than Evolutions, I can say I was both excited and worried. Would Fractures live up to the legacy of Evolutions? Well, yes and no. Evolutions has a much broader range of stories, and almost all of them are complete and contained in some manner. Fractures is a different beast, with stories that span the Halo universe in time and space, and almost all of them having some connections to current events. Some straightforward, some obscure. But at the end of the day, how was Fractures? For me, it was an absolute blast. None of the authors were disappointing, and though some stories felt a little shorter than they should be, they were all exciting to read. A few I think I'll need to reread, in fact, as I'm sure there's some stuff I missed. I loved how each story had a small introduction, letting the reader know when the story was set, even in relation to other fiction. While Halo Evolutions is still my favorite anthology novel, Fractures is damn good on its own, and even better in places. With careful consideration, I have to give Halo Fractures a 9.5 out of 10. Scores for individual stories will vary, but overall I think it's an accurate representation of the quality of Fractures. So, for those of you who have read the book, what did you think? What was your favorite story? What was your least favorite? What did you like and dislike? Let's get a discussion going down below. Thanks for watching as always, and until next time, this has been Halo Cannon. Hey guys, thanks for watching. Be sure to give a like and consider subscribing and sharing this video around. Also consider subscribing to Loot Crate. By going to trylootcrate.com slash halocanon and using promo code BRIDGE10, you can save 10% on a new subscription to the base Loot Crate offering. Loot Crate is a monthly subscription box service for epic geek and gamer items and pop culture gear.